Good evening, dear friends of MOCA, and welcome to this very special moment for MOCA. And thank you for joining us because we are celebrating 29 years, 29 memorable years uh, of MOCA. And today we are in the Church of Santa Monica, a very special space to celebrate this day. And we have today two parts of the event. The first is a presentation by Kevin Fernandez on the making of the podcast Altars of Time. So before I go into the making to tell you that India Foundation for the Arts, a Bangalore-based foundation, and the Museum of Christian Art in 2021 collaborated and announced two projects one of which is the podcast series, The Altar of Time, a history of India's Christian art that has been implemented successfully. And it is a podcast series that has been produced by Anirudh Kanisetti as the project coordinator, along with Kevin Fernandez, who's here with us today. And this has been made possible with the support from the Goyth Institute, Max Mueller Bhavan, New Delhi and the Parijat Foundation. I would now like to introduce Kevin Fernandez, who is here with us today and will be talking to us about the making of the podcast. Kevin Fernandez is a researcher and currently an assistant professor of English at the Indian Institute of Psychology and Research, Bangalore. He has collaborated on this project with Anirudh Kanisetti and Today, we are going to hear all about the making of the podcast. As you know, we launched the podcast yesterday. It is on Spotify. Uh, the first episode is already up, so do listen, and we'd love to hear your feedback. But now over to Kevin to know a little more about the making of this podcast series, The Altar of Time. Am I audible? No. Can't check. OK, I'll just hold it here. Check, 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 yeah. I never thought post Zoom I'd ever have to ask people if I was audible. Uh, all right. Good evening, everyone. Um, my presentation is titled uh, Penaconda pineapples and pelicans, the making of the altar of time, a history of Goa through its Christian art. Um, next slide, please. The, the next slide. Yeah. So um, I'm beginning with this image. Uh, this is Penaconda. Most of you may not have heard this name. Penaconda is a tiny little town 555 kilometers from this spot. Um, and it's historically important because it was the second capital of the Vijayanagar Empire following the Battle of Talikota. Um, about four kgs ago, or five years ago, um, Anirudh and I had traveled to Penaconda in search of this place, Penaconda. We climbed up to the top of the hill, and you can see it's absolutely breathtaking. Uh, this was the place that the Vijayanagar Empire retreated to, and at the center of the hill there was a little tank. And all around this tank, there would have been bazaars, there would have been nach girls, there would have been, uh, you know, the whole setup for an empire or an emperor in exile of sort. And today, it's just those stones lying there. And we wondered what it would have been like when it was alive, when it was active. Uh, what if the stones could talk? What if those plants could tell us what they've seen over all those years? And. Um, yeah, we left Penaconda, we came back to Bangalore. And I think this particular trip uh, resulted in our project because um, it's right from that point onwards that we kept wondering, you know, what if monuments could speak? What if objects could speak? Uh, what if they could tell us the things that they saw or did? Next slide, please. Yeah. Um, so our project, the, the vision or the idea behind our project was to take history out of the dusty tomes of archives, out of the glass cages of museums, and um, place them in people's homes, uh, place them in people's commutes, 
and place them in people's workout sessions. Uh, because that's what a podcast does, right? Um, during the pandemic, all of us were stuck at the sink of Sisyphus, uh, washing sink load after sink load of dishes. And um, I responded to that by listening to music and then after some time listening to audiobooks and then very soon listening to podcasts, right? Um, so, th so that's where this idea comes from, right? Taking history out of these spaces which are supposed to be historical and making them available to people, right? Wherever they are, when you're stuck in Bangalore's traffic, when you're doing the dishes like I was, or maybe when you're taking a run in the park, right? Uh, who's to say that this experience, this very ordinary, banal experience, cannot be an educative one, cannot be an entertaining one? Uh, it's also inspired by the idea of museums without borders, right? The idea that a museum does not necessarily have to be located in a singular space. It can exist in multiple spaces and in multiple forms. Um, and also um, from the text by the um, director of the British Museum titled The History of the World in a Hundred Objects, right? Um, which talks about the history of the world in a hundred objects. Um, it's also possible for the podcast to be seen as a kind of curatorial tool, right? Um, so we saw that here. Uh, when you enter the museum, there's a QR code. You can scan it. And even if there's no one around to tell you something about a particular object, perhaps someday, of course, this particular podcast series has 25 episodes, but perhaps someday, maybe there will be a podcast series that covers all objects in this museum, right? Um, and I think at a very personal level, one of the questions that this podcast opens up is these two categories, the Indian and the Christian, and how, they do, how, how these two categories relate to each other. Because these two categories are constantly uh, questioned and contested in today's day and age. What does it mean to be an Indian? And for those of us who belong to this religious minority, what does it mean to be an Indian Christian? Right? Uh, this is a popular idea that everything Christian is Western, but that's not necessarily true, right? as we'll see uh, in the course of the podcast, uh, which is why I've placed this particular image here in the center of this chasuble, which is in the collection. Uh, of course, there are these very beautiful floral motifs uh, which ask us that eternal question, where do these motifs come from, right? Is this one of the first examples of appropriation, a design traveling from the east to the west and then becoming the floral paisley motifs of the west? But for me, what's more exciting is the pineapple in the center. Um, the pineapple is never mentioned in the Bible. And that's because the, the world of Christ did not know the pineapple. The pineapple is a new world fruit. Uh, the world of Christ and the world of India saw pineapples for the first time in the 15th century. When Europe saw pineapples for the first time in the 15th century, they were the equivalent of a luxury sports car today. Uh, the nobility of Europe would rent pineapples to place them at tables in their banquets because they were such a rare and exotic fruit which had to travel across the sea from the new world. Right? Um, so the pineapple then became a symbol of royalty or nobility because of the crown on the top of the pineapple. Um, which is, and of course, in the European context, Christ was royal, Christ was divine, and therefore he deserved such a royal symbol. And eventually when the cultivation of pineapple reached the old world, reached Europe and reached India, there was this misconception that the pineapple plant dies to give out fruit. And for those of us who are Christian, we know how apt that metaphor is for the life of Christ. Right? Uh, so this is an example of this conversation between these two categories, the category of the Indian and the category of the um, Christian. Right? Um, because you know, a quick Google search will tell you that there is no Christian art object which has the image of the pineapple. The only two, the closest two art objects which have the image of something close to a pineapple is the pine cone. Uh, in Vatican Square. All right. um, so in the course of this podcast, we hope to ask and address these questions as well. What does it mean to be Indian? What does it mean to be Christian? And how do these ideas uh, strike up a conversation with each other? Next slide, please. So why a podcast? A podcast is a growing medium. Uh, it's very, very popular. Uh, I'm from Bangalore and where I live. Uh, the first question people ask, there used to be a time when people would ask you, what book are you reading? That shifted to what TV show are you watching? And today in Bangalore, people say, what podcast are you listening to? Right? So podcasts are a very upcoming uh, uh, form or an upcoming medium. Uh, and that's partially because of the reduction of our attention span. Right? Um, our attention span, I, I work with young adults. 
uh, the attention span of most of my students is the duration of a reel on Instagram. Anything longer than that is challenging. I have to compete with TikTok and Instagram in the classroom, and it's very, very difficult. Right? Uh, but the podcast space, just by virtue of being five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes long, allows for that kind of attention span. Um, also, uh, Anirudh, my very, very beloved friend and collaborator, uh, has uh, two very, very successful history podcasts titled Youth, uh, Echoes of India, which talks about the history of India. Uh, it's India's first history podcast. And Yuddha, which is a military podcast, the history of, the, the, of military conquest and how warfare developed in India. Um, the podcast medium also allows for organic growth. Now, um, I'm sure uh, there was a time when we went to libraries searching for something and then we found something else, right? We discover another book, another author. Uh, we do that on Wikipedia today, right? The unending loop of hyperlinks. Um, and that's what podcasts permit, right? Anyone randomly browsing on the internet will chance upon a podcast. And this is a, a, a significant um, observation when we want to transmit information um, because with all due respects to museums and exhibitions, these are time and space bound, right? If I wasn't in Goa today, I would not be able to see this exhibition, even though I've visited this museum before, and I probably will visit it again. But this particular exhibit, which you see right now, uh, exists only in this time and space. In a, few, in a few days, in a few weeks, this exhibit will no longer exist. And I will only be able to experience it through photographs. But um, a podcast or anything that exists on the internet lasts forever, or at least as of now, lasts forever. Right? Uh, and the last reason why we chose the podcast form was the pandemic. Uh, this project began during the pandemic. Uh, I was in Bangalore at the time, Anirudh was in Hyderabad, and this project site is in Goa, and travel was absolutely impossible. Uh, but through the generosity and cooperation of the team at uh, Mocha, material was made available to us digitally, and we were, we, it was possible for us to work on this remotely without having stepped into this space. And to be very honest, today I really, really regret that because um, had I spent more time here with these objects uh, in this space, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure the podcast could have possibly taken a very, very different uh, direction. Uh, I'm not going to uh, spend too much time talking about the space. Uh, I'm sure you're all friends of Mocha. If not, please become friends of Mocha. Um, so I'm not going to spend too much time here. I'll move on to the next slide, please. Yeah, uh, these are pictures from my uh, last visit here when I came. Um, and they're all around us right now. Move to the next slide. OK, uh, what, what are the ways? How did we approach this particular project? Um, I'd like to call it uh, a Marxist approach a bottom-down approach. Uh, we're attempting to tell history from, I mean, particularly in our podcast, one of the questions we constantly ask ourselves is, who made this object, right? Uh, because there's a very interesting um, paradox. Uh, I'll just jump to the second point. Um, these objects, sometimes, some, some of these objects, we know who commissioned the object. We know who donated the object. But we do not know who made the object. And that is a very, cruci a very crucial gap right, in this particular process. Uh, because while on one hand, commissioning the object or purchasing the object uh, gave livelihood and sustenance to the artisan who made the object, uh, in the same process, the artisan's identity is also wiped away. We do not know who these people are. We do not know if it was one person, if it was one family. We do not know if it was a group of artisans. Uh, we do not know if the same object was worked and reworked multiple times across its uh, lived history. Right? Um, which is why I'd like to believe that this is a, a, a Marxist reading. We're, we're attempting to read from the bottom up and not from the top down, which is normally what we read in our school textbooks. Um, it's also the idea was to bring to life uh, these objects and take them out of the museum space. So in the museum, they are impersonal objects which are there in glass cases. But these were not objects made to be kept in glass cases. These were objects made to be touched. These were objects made to be seen. These were objects made to be used. Right? And they get dehumanized or depersonalized in the museum space. So the idea was to give, give back some of that life to these objects and tell us why these objects are used. Um, the, uh, the third idea is also very fascinating, right? The object in its original context was very, very exclusive. 
uh, I'm, I come from a practicing Catholic household and I don't know the number of times I have seen an, a monstrance up close and personal. It's always easily 10 to 20 feet gap between me and the monstrance. Right? Um, these objects, even though they were meant to be used, they were exclusive, they were detached, they were not objects people could touch, the, the common people rather, could touch, see uh, and experience or engage with. Um, but in the museum, uh, that changes. Right? I am up close and personal with the, I may not be able to touch the object anymore. So that's another very interesting paradox. In the original context, the use of the object could touch it, but couldn't necessarily see it. Whereas in the museum, I can see the object, but I can no longer touch it. Right? It's very fascinating inversions happening in the process of curation and in the process of engaging with these objects through the museum space. And um, the last approach that uh, one has to keep in mind when we talk about these objects is the fact that um, there is this category called Indian Christian art or Indian Christian art objects. And this is an alive category. Across the state of Goa, across the entire land of India, there continue to be churches with candlesticks, with monstrances, with liturgical utensils, with liturgical linen, which continues to be made. Right? So this is not some dead category in museum spaces, this is an alive category, it is evolving constantly. Its form and meaning will change. Right? Um, and the tragedy of the whole thing is that we still see these as functional utilitarian objects, objects that are to be replaced in the church every time they are no longer functional or every time someone makes a large donation. Let's change the table linen. Let's change the candle stands. Let's change the uh, liturgical utensils. Right? We, we we still don't we still don't fully recognize this living category as an art category. Uh, and hopefully, uh, perhaps through this project and through other similar projects like the work Mocha does, uh, this category will also begin to be recognized. Right? We have a category called Indian Islamic art with subsections, right? You, you have the Deccan, uh, the, the Deccan Sultans, you have the Gujarat, uh, the Islamic art from Gujarat, you have the Islamic art from Kashmir, um, from the uh, Nawabi states of Lucknow, uh, I mean, Aud and Ka uh, Calcutta, uh, Madurai, there are all of these spaces which we recognize as centers of Islamic art, each with their distinctive flavor. We still do not have that category called Indian Christian art. And I feel now more than ever, we require that category. Now more than ever, when we are told that we are not Indian enough, it is very, very crucial that we assert the Indianness of this community and of its art forms. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so I chose this image. Um, this is the monstrance. You can see it in the museum's collection. Uh, and this is how I probably saw monstrance as a child. But when I came to the museum, I noticed that little flower there in the center. And I've seen women wear these as earrings. So there's a very good chance that when this monstrance was commissioned, um, a goldsmith who had made women's earrings or made women's bangles uh, was asked to make this. Right? And because we don't know who this goldsmith is, because we don't know what the brief uh, was, um, there's this eternal question, is this an accident? Is, you know, is this something that slipped into the object without the commissioner knowing? Right? Or um, was this part of the design, right? Or, or was this agency expressed by the artisan themselves, right? These are questions we perhaps will not know the answers to. The next slide, please. Um, and then there's uh, Saint Sebastian person. I mean, anyone who's interested in art history knows a very, very complex history of this particular saint and his representation. And I will not go into that complex, very colorful and very fascinating history. But I want to draw your attention to his ribs and how beautifully formed they are. Which again, I would have ne I've never seen as a child looking up at the statue of Saint Sebastian in the church. Uh, there's um, a bust of his right there. Um, I, I would have never seen it as a child looking up to him as a, in the church, right? But here in the museum, I could almost count the ribs um, on his body. And um, that is both, a, 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 I was talking to uh, Hita a few moments earlier about how that is a sublime experience because it's not just, a, um, an experience that is um, through the lens of faith, it's also through the lens of art, right? Acknowledging the fact that there was so much effort that went into outlining this object, which perhaps would not, never have been seen at such, uh, at such an intimate level. Yeah. 
Uh, this is a bit about the podcast. Uh, it's 25 episodes, each episode dedicated to one object or in some cases a collection of objects, two or three similar objects. Uh, and each within 15 minutes, some, it ranges from about 7 to 15 minutes depending on the nature of the object, which is a total of six hours altogether. Uh, we'll have a weekly release beginning yesterday, which will go on till the month of July this year. And um, each, um, each episode deals with one object and its history. Now, there are different ways we approach this history. Sometimes it's the history of the object in the liturgical context. Right? how this object has evolved in the space of the church, what it used to be used for, what it's used for today. Sometimes it's a story of the artisans or the art school where we can try to locate this particular object. Sometimes it's a story of the motif that is used in the object. Right? So there are different lenses that we have used in different episodes uh, to tell you the story of these objects. Um, and whenever possible, we've also tried to collect it to the larger Indian Ocean world, uh, to Africa, to uh, South America, to Sri Lanka, to um, um, what is problematically called the Far East, right? which is also part of the colonial world. Uh, wherever possible, wherever we could make these, uh, wherever we could trace these connections, we've tried our best to do so. The next slide, please. Uh, how did we do this? We began obviously with a long list after uh, Natasha sent us this beautiful catalog. And then after a lot of back and forth, we came down to 25 objects. And then came another very crucial question. How do we order these objects? Right? What is the sequence in which we put these objects? Uh, so our first thought was, let's put them in, um, uh, in a chrono chronological order. That came with a different set of problems. Uh, many of the objects that survive do not, I mean, or rather most of the objects in the museum's collection come from the, uh, se very few from the 17th, but most from the 18th and 19th century. And this is for obvious reasons. Um, because these are objects used on a daily basis, they are subject to wear and tear, right? Um, because of the humidity, there is also, you know, uh, problems of maintenance of these objects. And uh, prior to the 17th century, it's very, very difficult to find art objects existing in their original condition. Um, so we had to scrap that uh, approach, right, chronology, because we have most of our objects from one time period. The next position we took was, um, let's try to recreate the museum in the oral form, right? So as one entered the museum, what are the different directions one would take and what objects one would encounter? But then we realized with that form, the problem was, um, in, in, the, in the curation process of a museum, you group similar objects together. Right? So you will hear three episodes about fabric, three episodes about silver, three episodes about statues, which may not necessarily be exciting all the time. Uh, so we had to rework on that. And um, then uh, came the day when I actually came to the museum site and um, had a very beautiful conversation sitting right there on the steps with uh, Preeti. And then I went back to Bangalore, I called up Anirudh and um, we spoke about it. And he said, what if we tell the story the way a believer would see this? So what is the first object you would encounter when you entered the church, right? And as you made your way through the church up onto the altar, what are the different objects you would encounter? And that is the approach that we took, right? So um, of course, we place the pelican monstrance first uh, because it is an absolutely sublime object. Uh, but our next episode uh, will begin talking about this building and the meaning that this building has over time. Because if you were to enter this museum, that's the first thing you'd notice, the flying buttresses, those horrific looking spikes that divide the museum from the church, right? Um, so that's the kind of uh, position we took, right? So we'd first talk about the, the, the building, the church, and the museum. And then we'll talk about the different objects that one would encounter if this was still an active site of worship, right? So the garments of the priest, the incense thurible, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and of course, our research was primarily done through online resources and in the case of a few objects, um, interviews. Next slide, please. Okay. How did we do this? Uh, so it would begin with uh, me. Uh, I would, uh, I mean, because again, you know, uh, when Anirudh uh, came to me with this idea and said, you know, let's do this project, I said, I'm not from a history space. Um, I'm not from an art history space. Uh, I'm just an English teacher really struggling to teach people to speak grammatically correct English. And uh, I'm just a, a little Catholic boy from Mangalore. And he said, that's exactly why you should tell the story, right? Because you are an insider. 
Um, so the script would begin with me. I would uh, write about these objects, uh, how I would see them being used in churches, at homes, in homes, etc. And then I'd send them to Anirudh, who would um, you know, uh, do a little more uh, historical work. And then he'd send them back to me with his suggestions and corrections. We'd then send them to Mocha. Uh, Mocha would give us their feedback. Sometimes there would be historical inaccuracies. Sometimes there would be ideas which would be ambiguous or sometimes problematic, and we would rework on them. And then once that was done, um, we'd rework the script based on the feedback they'd give us. Then we'd send it to Ishan. Ishan is our sound engineer. Uh, he would you know, have a conversation about what he thought should go into the oral soundscape of the project. And then it would be recorded. Uh, Anirudh is the voice of the podcast. Anirudh would record it. Some episodes are voiced by me. Um, and um, through the museum, we got in touch with Tina Costa. Um, and Tina, is she here? Okay, there. Tina is there. It's the first time I'm meeting Tina. I've only corresponded with her via email. So Tina uh, translated some episodes for us and voiced them as well. And once it's voiced, uh, it goes for record. I mean, it goes for editing. The soundscape is added. Uh, we share it with Mocha. Mocha tells us what requires reworking. And then it's approved, right? Um, and there's a reason why I put the Pelican Monstrance here. Because um, one of the biggest challenges at this stage of the project is um, writing, right? And I'll tell you why it's a challenge. Because one, we have to engage with theology, scripture, church tradition, and local culture, right? These are all very different and not necessarily interrelated categories. And all of these things need to find themselves articulated in some form in the duration of the podcast. The second thing is that I come from an academic space where if I have nothing to say, I will just use long sentences to confuse you. Okay? Um, and that doesn't work when you are listening to a podcast. Okay? So I write for a reader, but Anirudh writes for a listener. Right? Uh, so there were those kind of conflicts, right? And he, he called me back and he's like, bro, I can't understand what you're saying. Like, <laughs> please uh, change this, right? And we'd rework sentence structures, rework ideas. Um, he'll call me up and be like, transubstantiation. Like, what is this? And then I'll have to, you know, we have to go back, visit doctrine, simplify doctrine, communion. You know, uh, so many things that I take for granted by, by virtue of being uh, a Christian culturally and religiously may not necessarily be accessible to someone who's not from a Christian background. Right? So that kind of translation also needs to take place from the space of tradition, theology, dogma, uh, to a space where people who are not from uh, this, this cultural milieu can access these ideas. Um, and um, yeah, so we're primarily writing for non-academic people, we're primarily writing for non-Christians, right? Uh, which also, uh, after yesterday's release, uh, dawned upon me that you know sometimes the language of our podcast can be controversial. Because we have to talk of these things as myths, legends, texts, right? which may not necessarily always be acceptable to a believer. Right? But the podcast is not just for the believer. The podcast is to take the museum outside its spaces, take the museum outside the people who are expected to go and see these objects. Right? And therefore, um, I sincerely hope that the times when we have used these expressions don't uh, run us into trouble, right? And, and that's why the, the pelican is very fascinating, because it comes to us um, from one tiny line somewhere in the Psalms, uh, and then, you know, uh, has, takes a life of its own in the tradition of Western Christian art. Next slide, please. Yeah, so these are some behind the scenes. That's Anirudh recording uh, an um, episode of ours. Uh, that's me together with Ishan, very disapprovingly looking at me because of the number of times we had to do that same episode again and again. Uh, the next slide, please. Oh, it's something very fascinating about this podcast is also the um, sound, right? So um, we came across um, the Bangalore men singing in St. Andrew's Church. And I called up Ishan. I said, do you want to go? He said, we'll go. We got permission, and we recorded. And if at all you have uh, heard the podcast, you'll hear that the sound begins with a lot of disturbance. There's the sound of footsteps, there's the sound of people murmuring. Those are all real people in church for a church service. Right? And I thought that was absolutely fitting for a podcast that talks about real objects. Right? So we're very lucky to have the soundscape uh, from St. Andrew's uh, pipe organ. There are only two pipe organs that still work in Bangalore. One is St. Andrew's, the other one is St. Mark's. And we have a small snippet from the pipe organ of St. Andrew's as the uh, opening intro for our podcast. <laughs> 
Next slide, please. Okay. The challenges that we faced in this podcast. Uh, one of the things that IFA, uh, India Foundations for the Art, is very, very particular about is um, that we do not produce content in stylos of excellence. It has to be accessible. And one of the things they encourage us to do is to work this podcast into the language of Goa, which is Konkani. And that opened a can of worms. Because whose Konkani do we tell this podcast in? Right? Uh, I'm not even from Goa. I'm from Mangalore. I'm from part of one of 44 ethnic uh, and cultural groups that call Konkani their mother tongue. And my Konkani is absolutely different from the Konkani spoken here in Goa. So whose Konkani do we tell this podcast in? Right? And mercifully, we did not <laughs> debate too much on this. Uh, we trusted Natasha, and Natasha trusted Tina. And that is how we have the script today, in a form of concrete, which is very, very accessible. Um, I must say that, uh, kudos to you, Tina. Um, as, as someone who's not proficient in Konkani and not proficient in any of the dialects of Konkani spoken in Goa, I could still understand uh, every word of the translation that Tina did for us. So I'm assuming it will be accessible across the dialects of Konkani spoken in Goa. So two episodes of ours are in Konkani, and uh, I'm very proud of this. I'm very grateful to IFA for pushing us in this direction as well. The second uh, major challenge we faced was uh, getting material, right? Getting primary data on these objects. Uh, some, I mean, the museum also finds it a very challenging uh, process, right? Because these are objects that are, I mean, think about it. How many of you remember where you bought the vessels in your house from? It's unlikely, right? Uh, and we're talking about objects which are 200, 300, 400 years old. So there's very little um, data available on the specifics of the objects, but we managed to circumvent that in other ways. And um, the last challenge is my favorite challenge. It's a beautiful turbul that you can see on the screen. And we haven't featured the turbul in our podcast, but um, any uh, practicing Catholic will know that turbul is a very important part of church worship. Um, it makes a very beautiful sound, the sound of the turbul being hit on the chains, right? It's done in threes. And um, we wanted to include that sound in our uh, soundscape. Uh, and we searched on the internet. There were masses being streamed online on YouTube. And even in these masses, you cannot hear the sound of the turbul because it's this very soft, chinking sound. It's only something that you can hear in real life. Um, the next idea was obviously to record it in situ, but it is used at the most sacred parts of the mass. Uh, it's impossible to have someone running onto the altar with a voice recorder, right? Um, and um, uh, can you go to the next slide, please? Yeah. So after I explained what it is to our sound engineer, our sound engineer found this clip from Eyes Shut Wide by Quentin Tarantino. Uh, it's not a very Christian scene. And I'm not going to tell you what happens after the scene. But he looked at this, he figured out how the turbul works, and then he took his dog chain and uh, utensil in his house and recreated the sound of the turbul. Right? So you can see the mic, uh, the utensil, and the dog chain. And this is a landmark moment, I feel, in the process of making a, um, a, a podcast. Um, it, um, it takes me back to the work of Henri Lefebvre, the French Marxist theorist, who talks about the production of space. Right? Uh, we have an idea of what a church should sound like. Uh, but when we recorded the sound of the church, it didn't sound like what we thought the church sounds like. Right? So then we have to create sounds that fit into this idea or fit into this imagination. And that creation is not necessarily from this space. It sounds a little convoluted and it sounds a little circular, but uh, that's exactly the process we went through. Right? Recording a sound uh, in situ was not possible, uh, but we know what the sound sounds like. We know what people should think of when they hear the sound. And therefore, using objects which are not from this space becomes very, very crucial. Right? So your imagination of space, your perception of space, and then how we conceive space. And this is all happening through sounds, through audio topes. Right? And it also asks important questions of authenticity. Right? What is authentically a church sound? What is authentically the sound of a turubur, right? Uh, but those are metaphysical questions that we don't really have the space for. Move forward, please. Uh, so this is how our project pans out, um, public engagement through the form of the uh, podcast. 
Uh, this is Natasha and me. We uh, spent two days in Calcutta at a conference organized by IFA, uh, where uh, so. Uh, uh, I'd like to count this as part of the outcomes, really. Uh, a part of the outcomes are the podcasts, uh, which is available to the public, uh, the presentations slash panel discussions, uh, where uh, my panel spoke about accessibility, because we were using new forms. Uh, Natasha's panel spoke about uh, the, the challenges that museums spa uh, face. Um, and I hope at some point in the future, we can take this project forward, right? In other ways, uh, maybe talking about this process itself, which is so fascinating uh, in other spaces. Um, I hope, I sincerely hope this project will also open up more conversations around these two categories, this category called the Indian and this category called the Christian, and how these two categories come together. Uh, and like I said, 25 episodes uh, in English and Konkani, which were released yesterday on the 21st of January, 2023. Yeah. Uh, if you'll indulge me for a minute, uh, I'd just like to um, end expressing gratitude. I think it would be um, unfair to end this presentation without placing on record um, gratitude in so many different forms. Um, my first point of gratitude is to Anirudh for believing in this project. He's not here because he's at the Jaipur Literature Festival uh, talking about other things. Uh, but I'm grateful that he came to this museum, he saw this museum, and he found the uh, call for projects of MOCA and IFA and convinced me that we should work on this together. So thank you, Anirudh. Um, I'd like to place on record my gratitude to IFA, India Foundations for the Arts, for all of their support through this project. Um, specifically, three people, Suman, who was our first project coordinator, Sumana, who helped us through some bumpy times, and Ritrika, who's uh, our current contact point in IFA. Uh, I'd like to thank Moka, um, Natasha, Preeti, and um, Ruthwa. Yeah, Natasha, Preeti, and Ruthwa, who have, uh, you know, given me this opportunity to present this podcast, right? They could have just said, you know, send us the podcast and be done with it, but they insisted that I come here and speak to you about the podcast. I'm very grateful for that opportunity. I'm grateful um, to you for letting me represent you. Uh, for many people, the first time they will engage with Mocha, hopefully, will be through the podcast. We hope that this podcast will bring visitors here. And it takes a lot of trust and belief um, to allow someone who's not part of your organization, someone who may not necessarily say, share the same vision, to allow them to represent uh, you to the world. So thank you to the IFA team. And yeah, thank you for uh, uh, all of your friendship, actually, more than anything else. They've been absolutely great friends, and I'm so grateful for that. Um, I want to thank my institution uh, for giving me all the leaves I required, for letting me take calls and uh, get this work done. I work at the Indian Institute of Psychology and Research. So thank you to my principal and my colleagues. Uh, I want to thank my family for tolerating me all these years. Um, and um, I'd say for sacrificing me. Um, they could have forced me to be a doctor, an engineer. They could have forced me to go to the Gulf. They could have forced me to uh, join the ship like most Konkani boys do. Uh, they could have forced me to be successful and rich. Instead, they allowed me to be happy. And for that, I will always be grateful. Um, it, it's also very humbling for me to speak in front of my family. Uh, it's also humbling for me to stand here because I have worked with these objects for the last two years um, in a long distance relationship. Right? We were talking about this yesterday. It's like dating through Zoom, right? I would see these objects in pictures um, and then, you know, have to write about them. And to talk about these objects today in front of them is very, very overwhelming for me personally. Um, and finally, I'd just like to thank um, all the nameless and faceless artisans uh, whose work we celebrate in this podcast. Um, it is through them that the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. Um, so thank you to all of you. Yeah. If you have any questions. Thank you so much, Kevin. Um, we have, we don't have time, but we would like to give you the opportunity to ask Kevin any questions or to say a few words if you'd like to say about the presentation. So anybody who would like to ask any questions can just raise your hands and we'll pass the mic around. No questions. Okay, Susanna. Thank you, Kevin. It's a wonderful project. Um, I'm also familiar with podcasts in my own institution. 
But I'd like to know, why didn't you decide to record the sound of that instrument, I don't know the name in English, I'm sorry, uh, in a church, for example? It would be more easier for you. Um, so we were working through the pandemic and going to an actual church was, yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, and thank you for sharing your research process and methodology, because that's usually not shared, uh, shared with the public. Could you talk a little bit about what was the most difficult and challenging, and what was the most exciting in this process? Um, to, to be honest, the most challenging part is to find time, to find time and discipline. I, I wouldn't say it's time, it's discipline, right? The ability to block out everything and sit and read at a stretch or sit and write at a stretch. That was the most challenging bit. Uh, every moment of this project is exciting. I cannot tell you how many rabbit holes I've fallen down, uh, how many discussions we've had. Uh, just, you know, you start at one point and then you go in completely different directions. Um, so every moment of it, I mean, I know it sounds like a cliche when I say it, but I really do mean it. Every moment of it is exciting because I, I never really know what I will encounter uh, when I start writing. I never know what I will encounter when I start reading. And I never know where it will uh, take me or that particular script. Yeah. All right. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much, Kevin. We have to put We'll just wait a few minutes so that we can set up the next presentation. We now move to the second presentation that will be made by, uh, it's, it'll be a brief presentation by Dr. Vidya Daheja on her book, India, A Story Through 100 Objects. Dr. Daheja is a Barbara Stoller Miller Professor of Indian and South Asian Art at the Columbia University in New York and the recipient of a Padma Bhushan conferred on her by the President of India in 2012 for achievement in art and education. She has been the pioneer of research in the Buddhist art of the centuries BC to the es esoteric temples of North India and from the sacred bronzes of South India to art under British Raj as evidenced by her other published works, The Thief Who Stole My Heart, The Material Life of Sacred Bronzes from Chola, India, 855 to 1280, to Discourse in Early Buddhist Art, Visual Narratives of India, The Great Goddess, Female Divinity in South Asian Art, and much more. In conversation with her after her brief presentation uh, will be Vivek Menezes, who is the co-founder and co-curator of the Goa Arts and Literature Festival, GALF, which just ended yesterday. Uh, and he's also a widely published writer and photographer, and most importantly, a great friend of MOCA. Welcome, uh, Dr. Deheja and uh, Vivek. Uh, initially, we are, you have a few words to say. Yes, we just learned that uh, Professor Deheja has not formally launched the book yet. So, as a, if you don't mind, please send us and join us with your own copy. Yeah, please. You want me to hold it? Yes. You get my copy. Please. Well. Okay. I think I may have taken the last one. Come, Natasha. Yes. It's getting reflected on the yeah. shot. Come in front, because the table is Okay, fine. No, that's before Dr. Vidya. Is this good, Michael? Done. 
Thank you, Vivek. <clears throat> Thank you, Natasha. It's an absolute pleasure to be here this evening. And what I hadn't realized was that there's a synergy between Kevin's talk and my talk. It's absolutely amazing the number of things that he mentioned, which you will hear me mention too. So thank you, Kevin, for that wonderful little presentation. Um, I'm going to speak about eight objects out of my hundred. Now you can imagine that's a hell of a choice, okay? Um, but one of the questions I've often been asked, which I do not think anybody who's listened to Kevin would ever ask, is why a story through objects? You know, why, why? Why objects? And mine, of course, is it's the obvious thing to do. Why ever not objects? You know, we're constantly surrounded by objects in our homes, in our offices, wherever we are. We're surrounded by all these things that enable our everyday life, things that channel our lives, that dictate them, things that we take very often for granted. But these objects speak about us. They have a story to tell. They have a story to tell that reflects our values sometimes, our aspirations, our achievements, our dreams. And the objects reveal more about us than we realize. Just think about it. You go into the home of a person you're meeting for the first time. You look around you at the objects. And you immediately form some judgments, right? Objects. So, this book focuses on 100 objects to tell a story of India. How should I organize them? As Kevin said, chronology on its own is tedious. There has to be some chronology, but who would be interested? It would be boring if you followed pure chronology. It was a difficult task. And what I ultimately did was to let the story unravel through a series of thematic sections, there are 20 sections, which I think allow the objects to take center stage. Some of the objects in the book are going to be new to readers, as will be the stories that those objects tell. Other objects may be familiar, but they may not, the story they tell may not be so obvious. But one thing I wanted to do was to let those hundred objects shed light on the varying priorities over time, the differing strands of achievement that arose over the ages to create the rich multicultural medley that is today's India. It is truly a multifaceted culture. It has had room for varying priorities, for different points of view. That has been India's strength. That is still her strength today if we only we allow it to be her strength. And the story of India in that sense is an utterly unique story that no other nation in the world has ever had. And something that we are immensely proud of and should be proud of. Before I start on my objects, I must say that my story of India is a story, okay? It's a, a small a. And it's an idiosyncratic story at that. I'm not sure that there is such a thing as a totally neutral point of view or a detached point of view. You will see, and you will tell me what you think. So the object on the cover, it is this beautiful falcon on a perch. In today's digital age, if you type in the word falcon, you're probably going to get an image of a sh sheikh in a white robe with his hand stretched out with a, with a nice leather glove and a falcon on his hand. It's supposed to be the fastest bird in the world. And in the Middle East, it has more status symbol than anything. No Patek Philippe, what? no Ferrari has as much uh, sort of status as having that falcon on, on the perch. Well, the Mughal emperors also admired the falcon. And this particular object, gold, enameled, and then set with rubies and diamonds and sapphire and emeralds and onyx, is an absolutely exquisite object. It's small. It's only about that high. Um, and we think that it is Emperor Shah Jahan's 
personal object of personal object. Why do we think that? Because on the, on the perch, on the reverse of the perch, you can't quite see it, but over here, um, the name Ruzbihan is written. And we know from the official records of, of uh, Shah Jahan's reign that Khwaja Ruzbihan was the keeper of the personal treasures of the emperor. So he probably belonged to Shah Jahan, who of course, apart from the Taj Mahal, um, also commissioned that world famous peacock throne, which none of us have seen since it vanished once Nadir Shah took it and dismantled it into its various jeweled objects. Um, how was it used? There is a hole underneath it, for it could be used as a standard, probably a gold uh, rod. Perhaps Shah Jahan kept it right beside him as he conducted business. Um, and he, just to admire its absolute beauty. And incidentally, in the Sufi tradition, the falcon has a special meaning. The falcon returning to rest on the hand of its owner is the bewildered soul returning to God. Let's move to a very, very different type of bird. And one which with its the golden, uh, the silver globe on which, or wood, silver covered globe on which it stands is as you've seen next door, all of five feet high. It is an exquisite piece of work in silver. There is absolute fantastic texture given to the wings and to the body of the bird, all of this in silver. We've already heard through Kevin that it is a tabernacle monstrance. And he's also shown us the monstrance that I'm going to show you, or one very similar to that, so that you can see um, how the wafer that stands for the body of Christ, this consecrated wafer, is inserted into the monstrance from the rear. Uh, in the case of the bird, it is the chest that has that monstrance. To this audience, I scarcely need to tell you that the wafer and the blood stands for the body and blood of Christ. The wafer and the wine stands for the body and blood of Christ and his ultimate sacrifice for mankind on the cross. Um, as you can see here, there are these little baby birds that are reaching up towards the mother. In the, in the Catholic Christian context, that bird should be a pelican. It reminds one of, it has the beak of a maybe a Garuda-like beak. Um, it certainly isn't a pelican, which, which the artist obviously was not that familiar. In the early days of the Catholic presence in India, we all know about it in this context, so I'm not talking about um, Vasco da Gama, followed by Alameda, followed by Albuquerque in this, for this audience. But um, in the early days, uh, most of the uh, works of art for the churches did in fact come from Europe. But by the 17th century, when by the 1700s, certainly when this object was created, uh, it was the local craftsmen who were creating these. And I don't know whether you agree, but to me, there's a little bit more of the peacock, shades of the peacock in the way in which the artist has created this wonderful object. What do we have here? It's a page from a Jahangir album. And you, as you see, you have Emperor Jahangir on the top, a bust of him, and you have Christ carrying the cross on the bottom. These murakas, these, these albums, you can think of them somewhat in the terms of a scrapbook. Maybe we no longer make scrapbooks, but our parents or grandparents probably had scrapbooks. When you went out on a special trip, you cut out, the, you had your photograph, you put that on the page. Maybe you went to a special play or to a special playground, and you put the program of that on the page and you constructed it. That's exactly what a muraka is. These are two separate images that have been cut out not by Jahangir himself, but by his master artists. They know what the emperor enjoys and wants, and they have cut out two separate images, 
uh, Jahangir on the top, and the artist's signature in the white panel on the right, and then Christ on the cross with the artist's signature, a different artist. And then they have assembled it all together with first these narrow borders of white, then the second border with the cartouches with writing in them, and finally the outermost border. So they have created this wonderful page. And of course, the question is, why Christ on the cross at that in the Mughal court? It was because Akbar invited the Jesuits to come to the court. He invited everybody to come to the court. He invited Jain monks to come to the court. He went out to see Su Sufi monks and, and, and um, holy sacred holy men from the Islamic faith. He invited the Hindus in. He invited everybody. So it wasn't as if he was going to be changing his religion, but he was completely open, wanted to know more about all of this. And when the Jesuits came to court, they brought with them what is known as the Antwerp Polyglot Bible, which has woodcuts of all these scenes, and he told his artists to copy these. And so what we see in some of the Mughal albums is the copies that they made from the Polyglot Bible. Christianity, of course, I'm not going to talk about it to this audience, has a very early origin in India, St. Thomas, and then, of course, the Syrian Christians well before all of this. I want to move you early in time to the first century BC. And what we're looking at is an ivory figurine. It's quite small again. It's about 10 inches or so in height. It's a gorgeous little ivory figurine, the sensuous quality of early Indian sculpture, the elaborate jewelry, the necklaces, the, the bangles all the way from wrist to elbow, the anklets all the way from knee to ankle, uh, and it, it's an absolute fabulous little piece. It is the actual counterpart of the sandstone yakshis at Sanchi, at the Sanchi stupa. And in fact, at the Sanchi stupa, we have an inscription which says that one of the panels at Sanchi, not the fig these figures, one of the panels was created by the ivory carvers of Vidisha, which is the nearby uh, town, the town closest to Sanchi. But what I want to focus on here is the fact that this lovely little ivory was not found in India. It was found in the Roman town of Pompeii. Pompeii was covered with 10 feet of ash, volcanic ash, in the year 79. So this is pre-79. In the year 79 of this era, when Mount Vesuvius erupted, 10 feet of ash, the 1930s was when archaeologists began excavating Pompeii. And this ivory figurine was found in one of those rooms that they excavated. You know, the early centuries BCE and CE were, were an age of mercantile enterprise. The most common export, the most wanted export is Indian pepper. And vast quantities of pepper, together with ivory and other objects, went to the went to Rome via the Arab middlemen into the Mediterranean world. Recently uh, uncovered was a Roman recipe book, contained over 400 recipes, and all but five of those over 400 recipes depended on black pepper. The only place where they could get the vast quantities of black pepper was India. It was probably Kerala, from which most of it was, but of course it's also there in Goa. So this ivory figurine, along with all that pepper and actual elephant tusks and so on, traveled as part of early Indian trade. India was never isolated from the rest of the world. It always had trade contacts. Uh, what was the purpose of this little figurine? Um, I don't know what sort of chairs we are sitting on here, but at home I have one which has vertical slats at the back, which you rest your back against. And we think that that is her purpose, that she was part of a 
wealthy Roman nobleman's throne chair, shall we call it, which had, which was made of wood, but which had these ivory slats at the back. It would have been one of those really an object to be very proud of. Divine couples, Shiva and Parvati, also Vishnu and Lakshmi, many other deities, um, they are found across India, from north to south, from the Himalayas to the, the, to the deep south, from western India to eastern India. This is from Orissa. It's about six feet high, very different sort of size contact. But they, the artists across India portrayed the gods and their consorts as loving partners in a divine marriage. You can see how the artist has highlighted the intimacy between the couple. You can see that Parvati's hand is rests around um, Shiva's, goes around Shiva's neck and rests on his shoulder. You can see how Shiva's hand goes all the way around the goddess and, and is actually cupping her breast. How do you understand these images? Interestingly, we have a number of inscriptions which tell us how to understand them. For instance, there is an inscription at Kalinja in Uttar Pradesh, 1201, and it says, May Shiva, who experienced the delight of an embrace from Parvati, multiply your excessive delight. Or there's another one in, um, in UP again, uh, in Kanauj, dated to 1197, that says very much the same thing. And this is, this, these are the way the inscription stopped. The rest of the inscription talks about taxes you have to pay the king or the money that he was given for building a temple. But this one says, may Lakshmi's hand, which is caressing the neck of Vishnu, grant you happiness. So let us think of these in terms of prasad in a Hindu temple. When a Hindu goes to a temple, they take a tray of offerings. Uh, it, it have a coconut, some bananas, some flowers, maybe some good jaggery, and they give it to the priest who offers it symbolically to the deity. And then he gives you a piece of it, maybe a piece of the coconut, maybe one banana, maybe one blossom to take back with you. Think of these images all the way across the country as the artist's expression of devotion. He is presenting that image, or the poet is presenting that verse to the deity, asking for a tiny bit of it back for themselves. If you think about it in terms of prasada, it begins to make total sense. And of course, it is the importance of marital love, which is being stressed in all of this. Okay. The classic yoga pose, cross-legged in, in meditation, in Padmasana, is probably India's unique contribution to the vocabulary of world art in general. It dates back well over 2,000 years, 4,000 years, actually. Um, Patanjali composed his yoga sutras only in the fourth century, but we've got images, uh, seals from the Indus civilization, which was at its height 2600 BCE to 1900 BC, where you already have figures that are seated in Padmasana, here with their fingers stretched out. Yogic postures arose in a country that chose to sit on the ground, in which it is a comfortable posture for everyone. Um, and when you raise that figure up on a throne, like with the Buddha in the upper left, the figure simply sat cross-legged on top of the throne in the similar sort of manner. So this is an obvious sort of posture, in a way, for India. Scholars of yoga have recently suggested that standing yoga poses were largely developed very late on, after the 15th century. But if you go and look at something like this great cliff face at Mahabalipuram in South India, which was complete by roughly 700, you find that there are the 
some standing poses at least date back at least to the 7th century, if not earlier. You see both the genuine ascetic asking Shiva for a boon, standing in what we call Vrikshasana tree pose. And you also see the false ascetic cat who pretends to be an ascetic, lures all the mice into his reach and then pounces on them. And so one also has to think about humor as something that seems to have been, could be part of, of the expression. What do we have here? We're talking about zero. Zero is a concept that's so obvious that you know you can't even think of a time when it didn't exist. But there was a time when it actually didn't exist. Um, it's, it's nothing. Zero is nothing, but it is that indispensable nothing. And at the other end of the scheme, you've got infinity, which is that infinite number. And both the concept of zero and of infinity were developed in India. It's interesting to think about it. Um, it seems as if perhaps because in the philosophical circuit, there were these two concepts of nothingness, of shunyata, and infinity, ananta, that both zero and infinity could be comfortably accommodated within the Indian scheme of things. What is this manuscript? It gives us uh, an actual date by which we can say zero was definitely there. The Bakshali manuscript, which has been um, dated by carbon dating to the fourth century. And it's not some esoteric text. It just happens to be an account book of some merchants who are calculating payments, OK? So did no other country civilization come up with zero? Well, there were two that came up with what we call a placeholder, so that you have ancient Babylonia and you have the Mayan civilization. In the Mayan civilization, it was a shell, and there was a different symbol in Babylonia. But none of them thought of zero as a number that you could add to any other number, one to nine. So if you took seven and you added it, it sort of shifted the number one place to the left, but it increased the amount tenfold. So that obvious maths, you know, you take seven and you add zero, it's 70, 700, 7,000, 7, 70,000. That concept was an Indian invention. And I assume that it is the philosophical idea that you could have both extremes that may have led. There were two very disciplined modes of thought, mathematical principles and, on the other hand, philosophical speculation that seemed to have gone hand in hand. One last image for you today. What do we have here? We have a marble gravestone made in Kambat in the 15th century. Okay. It is um, beautifully carved. The Islamic calligraphy is as good as that you find anywhere else in the Islamic world. So it is artisans who knew um, how to follow the, the writing that must have been written out first for them on the, on, the, on the piece of thing. Uh, what is extraordinary about it is where these are found. They're found on either side of the Indian Ocean rim. This particular one was found in Aden, which is Yemen. But we've got them in, of course, in Sri Lanka. We've got 12 of them in Sumatra. We've got more of them in eastern Java. On the west coast, we've got them in Somalia, in Mogadishu, and it goes all the way into Lars, South Iran's province of Lars. It seems that between the 13th and 15th century, Gujarat, Kambat in particular, which, which seems to have been a source of the finest marble, um, exported these objects. They are heavy. I think I have a note somewhere 
300 pounds this particular one weighs. And I keep thinking about the 15 kilos that we are allowed on airplanes today. <laughs> They expo exported them across the Indian Ocean Rim. And because they are gravestones, they give us the name of the person who, and the date of his, his passing away, so that we realize that wealthy merchants, imams, and the sultans, particularly in, across the area, commissioned these objects and had them exported to them. I'm going to stop there so that Vivek can take over and we can have more of a discussion, perhaps. That was amazing. Much for that. Um, what a what a treat, right? Such a dazzling, super absorbing, really uh, brilliant exposition about these objects. I could really listen to that for a very long time. But I must say, uh, first of all, thank you so much for that. Um, it's a privilege to have this conversation here. Um, I read this book when it came out, and I, I gave it a rave review and. I also immediately was struck by the fact you included the MOCA object. So I want to spend a minute and congratulate the MOCA team um, over decades. I really appreciate the fact that this institution was not only set up with a particular ambit, but it's continued to improve in iteration after iteration. Um, where we are right now is an example, I think, of the kind of truly loving, but also very careful, meticulous treatment of a room that should take place actually all over Goa and India, very rarely is. Uh, this has undergone, undergone waves of, uh, of restoration with different experts from all over India, and they've produced something very marvelous. And the collection is, is, a str is a strong and stands as a beacon for, for, for Goan art and culture in a way that actually the fruit of your efforts, uh, Natasha and Mocha team, is that actually your object is in Vidya's amazing book, uh, Professor Deja's book. Um, these are the kind of objects, Goan culture in general, never appeared in these kinds of, very rarely appeared in these kinds of broad strokes approaches to Indian culture. And the fact that it is here is definitely partly due to the uh, you know, the strenuous efforts of MOCA. So first of all, big hand for MOCA, please. So I am a huge fan of Professor Deja and I've been for many years. This is, I just wanted to bring this copy because it is a truly invaluable work for me, of The Body Adorned, um, which is by Professor Deheja, and, and I've been a fan of hers for a very long time, and definitely when it comes to many of the more important objects um, that, uh, and in fact, way, ways of thinking about Indian history, I find that this is the invaluable scholar of our times. Um, but when this book came out, I definitely approached it with trepidation, which is what I wrote about in my review, because when you open a book like this, it's always going to be, almost always going to be deeply disappointing for those of us from certain parts of India which tend to fall out of the broad narratives. So I have in my head, Goa, of course, but I also have the transcultural networks, and I also have places like the Northeast. And I was delighted, literally, uh, you know, a smile spreading on my face as I went through there, and I found, boom, Professor Deja had touched all of those bases. So it was really a marvelous thing altogether. Um, and I was struck by the way you were talking about India in your presentation also. But I want to get to it immediately. Is this idea of India? Is it a dated? Is it Nehruvian? Is it dated? Do you deeply believe in the idea of, of India and the way that it can be defined a country um, via objects? Is it uh, India an idea or is it a nation state? I think I, I do have to. I, I honestly believe that if you look around at the objects, 
uh, and I've not touched on architecture that is a complete, I mean, it wasn't actually an object as such, so I didn't touch on it. But look at our architecture, look at our objects. Uh, it, it, it is multicultural. It is, over the centuries has been, it has absorbed the best, sometimes not the very best, of everybody who came in. They have been welcomed. I mean, think of the Parsis who came into Gujarat and around the 10th century from Lars, um, from Iran, and were welcomed by the king of Gujarat, who just said, welcome, you can follow whatever religion you want. The only thing I demand is that you have to learn the local language Gujarati, which is why the Parsis speak, if you can call it Gujarati, Parsi Gujarati, I would call it. So uh, it, it's, it is a multicultural, I mean, look at the, 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 the Jews have been there and they have left so much. I agree now most of them have gone to Israel, but it, they were welcomed here. They, they were not really persecuted. They came from places where they were persecuted. I do believe that uh, it is really a multicultural society and we've got to allow it to stay that way and not sort of in some way try to change a narrative because it may suit current politics, that we really have to allow the narrative to stand. It's wonderful. It's a very attractive vision of India, right? It's a vision of India that I certainly subscribe to. Um, in, in, uh, but, you know, it is, it is, it is one with perhaps which has limits. Um, Professor Deheja writes in her introduction, this book is a people's story, the story of merchants and traders, of craft people, jewelers, and artists, of thinkers and pathbreakers, but also of kings and queens. And her objective is to, quote, tell a different type of, of story of India that is, of course, placed in the context of dates, but in which chronology and dates, monarchs and battles do not dictate content. She says, objects speak to us, they speak about us, they have a story to tell. And part of the story that I'm getting from the objects is that national identity, if I may return to this, is a bit nebulous. I mean, you have these objects that are in Aden, you have magnificent objects that you, you have one in Cambodia, and certainly uh, there's a transnational kind of element to this. So would you say that this civilization that you're talking about extends well beyond the borders of uh, what India is today? Um, I don't really think of uh, the, the culture, uh, elements of the culture have certainly gone beyond the actual boundaries. So like Hinduism and Buddhism, which have traveled everywhere. Buddhism has traveled also to China and to Korea and to Japan. Uh, but particularly, you're thinking probably of Southeast Asia. Um, it traveled there, but then it developed in each of those countries in its own way. So that you, you, you see an image of Ganesha, you can clearly recognize it as Ganesha. But a Vietnamese charm Ganesha is very different from a Thai Ganesha, which is very different from a Cambodian Ganesha, which in its turn is different from the Indonesian Ganesha. Because the concept went there, and then it was local artisans who developed it in their own style so that you can easily say, ah, this is a Vietnamese Ganesha and this is an Indonesian Ganesha. So I, I think we have to let those civilizations be their own civilizations, having taken a, a, a major idea, which happens to be a religious idea, plus some language, which they then changed. Right. I do find it super interesting. I've been thinking about, we were thinking, we just had the Goa Arts and Literature Festival. And prior to that, I spent some time with Abdul Razak Gurna talking about this Indian Ocean world. Um, and, and I wonder about, about pinning down a civilization which seems to have cosmopolitanism at, at its core in a way, right? So it's, it's, it's a complex question. I'd like to ask you these questions because in this space particularly, which is so difficult for Indians, I mean, over the course of the last 20 years, I've come before the museum took it over and since, um, I've come in here with so many different people and the place seems to pose a challenge to people to peg down. 
maybe, maybe people don't realize this building was built before the Taj Mahal, right? Um, and, and a lot of the decorations, one of my favorite examples of this transcultural identity is actually on the walls here because you have azulejos, right? So the azulejos ostensibly are an Islamic Iberian form that are typical of Portugal. But over here we have azulejos which, have, which are more formally Islamic actually. They've got a pomegranate motif, most likely they came from Bijapur, they've come into this building here, Portugal's supposed to be enemies with the most, you know, it's these complexities that add so much. Um, so my question to you about this, about this is when you were going, setting about writing this book, um, what a challenge to take on a hundred objects and, and, and make an India story. Were you very conscious about this, being able to include these very pluralistic kind of stories, layers to this? To this? Um, yes, but it wasn't as if I had to search for anything to find it, because there were so many objects and so many phases of culture in which it was completely acceptable to have this. One of the things I had hoped, and it may, I hope it will still happen, is that a book like this could be used in schools, because that is where we want it. And a book which has a picture on one side and no more than 550 words on the other side could be something that teachers and schools could use. Um, I've given at least one further reading at the very back of the book, which a, a, a teacher could read and could then use that as a, a, a sort of a class session because we really don't know so much of India. Quite, I think, understandably, it's such a vast country and how are children in school going to travel to other parts of the country? But I think if we could visually tell them what there is in others, and maybe for that you need the architecture as well, because architecture is always stunning in its size. Um, I really would like to see it being used that way. Maybe it's a foolish idea, I don't know. I, think, I actually think that's a terrific idea. So I have a niece who's growing up in America, uh, my goddaughter, and I bought her a copy of this book because that's the amazing thing about it. So I'm a, you know, I also curate art and I'm, I'm quite a snob when it comes to these things. And once we got your book, Ranjit Hoskote and I were fanboying, as they, <laughs> as they say, about your selection because it's a very rare person who has this you know, authoritative encyclopedic ability to span literature as well as the historical object, uh, you know, several fields, but also has this super refined eye for beauty and playfulness. There's a, there are a lot of wonderful things in here. Quick question, are there any, uh, any uh, so I do think if uh, it should be in schools, this is a fantastic approach towards India. If we, this is the India, if you want, this is the India I want to live in, you know, I mean, the India I want, I want to live in is, is carefully curated with this meticulous eye by Professor Deja, and I do recommend it for anyone who has children, but also for someone who wants, you know, a kind of a one, one book on Indian aesthetics, you could scarcely go wrong, wrong with, uh, with this book. Professor Deja, I'm going to ask, uh, we will def I have many more questions, we'll go to the audience, but what about, what about, um, what about any regrets? Did you make any mistakes in here? So there's one thing I didn't particularly love about your book, is that you have four or five examples of India through the British, uh, the Raj era gaze, right? So one would have been enough for me, but... <laughs> yes, um, I guess that is the result of doing four exhibitions on British India, very different parts of British India, sure. but it, it was something I grew up in as right, well. Right, right. Um, I mean, I grew up immediately after the British left most of my life, but it, it was very much part of of my upbringing and it was something which was so ingrained in me that I couldn't, I couldn't bear to take something out. And then you said, uh, do I take out Edward Lear? He wasn't a major, major artist, but on the other hand, those wonderful limericks he wrote, you know, there was the old man of Calcutta who had bread and butter and you know, that sort of thing. I, I, I couldn't resist putting in um, an occasional person like Lear, who may not have been a major artist, but whose limericks I grew up on as a child and 
Um, that was lovely. And I also liked, uh, I mean, obviously it's not my personal choice, but your choice, the one culinary item was the vegetarian food, temple vegetarian food of Tamil Nadu, which obviously you're sentimentally connected to also at some level. Yes, that I guess I am. Right. Yes. So that was, that was lovely. Um, what, do you feel that we should be doing books like this for each state as well? I mean, is this a good approach, this material history where you present objects? Is this, is this in the end, because I find that in the, in the realm of ideas, when we're talking about Goa right now, the po politicians are getting into the history business in a, in a big way, right? So we're having a, we're having a very contested uh, set of narratives being imposed on us. I must say, Mocha does a wonderful job again and again of kind of very quietly, this beautiful exhibition here, the engraved treasures, is a reaction of a number of contemporary Goan artists of all different backgrounds. And I, I love the approach here. But, but in this, are objects something you can't argue with? Is objects something that is more like difficult to combat the truth of an object in front of you? Um, well, it's, it's very materiality. It's actually there. You have to deal with it. Um, I, I guess written narratives or something that... Well, there's two things about written narratives. One is that most of our records, we are now un unearthing records, but most of our records come from the ruling class. So you are getting, say, if it's a British, it is the British view of India, certainly. And if it's... So written records tend to have a slant of the type, of a particular type. And I feel that objects, well, yes, a lot of the beautiful objects are ruling class objects, but then there are others that speak in different ways. And it's very difficult to dismiss them completely because what do you do with them? There they are. So I think it's, I think it's an approach I like. I also find it very persuasive, but I must say this brings up in the last two or three years, last couple of years, post Black Lives Matter, uh, roads must fall, these kinds of major, the objects are being cancelled. I mean, objects have been dumped in the harbor and Bristol and, and uh, certainly the objects I have noticed again and again. I mean, I know people in Goa, people who I really respect, who've lived their entire lives in Panjim, uh, but have never come to Old Goa and will never come to Old Goa, to a church inside Old Goa, because these objects, and I was quite shocked to learn this, uh, but they are people like that. And this because the objects have a kind of a history which is complicated. How, and I think that's particularly true in Old Goa now, I mean, place where we are right now. How would you, what, what is your recommendation in situations like this? What should we be doing about objects? So there's a, I'll give you an example. There's one that I'm quite uh, interested in. There was a famous statue of Kamoj, the, 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 the Portuguese 16th century poet, who is significant because not only did he write the great work for, of Portuguese and create the modern language, but he wrote it in Goa, actually, a lot of it. And it's all about the coming to, coming to India. It's actually a transcultural document. But post-1961, uh, the statue of him, which I think it was here or maybe it was in Panjim, has been removed and put away. Do you think objects like that can have a future? Can we bring them out? Can objects, uh, do they have renewed value? I think it's a tragedy when we see that happen. I mean, all the statues of Queen Victoria. I mean, there was an era in which she had a place where people loved her. She, you can't put her down in the basement of museums where you usually have to go to find her. And you can find her in the midst of sawdust and, and wooden planks and things like that. Uh, erasing history is not something that should be done and should be done lightly. I really think that, you know, what is being done today in Delhi, for instance, I mean, the whole Central Vista theme, it is part of our history. We may regret it, some people may regret it, that's fine, but you can't erase it. At least you, I think firmly that you should not be erasing it. It is part of history and you have to let it be. You can say that this was a part of history that we are not proud of if that's how you feel about it. Contextualize objects. Yeah. I, I do. T I do and also, do more tend knowledge, to I think, is the, the really important thing. If you understand how that came about at a particular time, I think you're not going to want to cancel it, which is cancel culture these yes. days. 
Super interesting. Um, since I have this, so this is a question I'm going to go to the audience uh, in a second, but this is a question that Natasha and I and others who have been associated with Mocha have been asking ourselves for a long time, which is that at this point now, Goa gets millions of tourists and certainly hundreds of thousands of them, not millions, but hundreds of thousands of them will go just down the road to, to the uh, Bon Jesu and maybe to say cathedral because these are places on the tourism map. But this exquisite little museum gets almost nobody. And the challenge has always, I, th I, I don't know, maybe uh, at some point I argued a lot with the trustees that the name is a bad name, which it should never be called the Museum of Christian Art because I mean in the Vatican Museum is called the Vatican Museum. And you know, these objects are not just Christian. There are many other ways they could all, we could have a book just like this about Indian art, which is only objects with an ostensibly Christian bent. But I don't think that's it. What, what would you recommend? How, what are the kind of stories that the kind of stories you have told here, what are the kind of stories we should be telling about this place? It's a sort of story that Kevin has managed to put into a podcast. I mean, I think that's absolutely remarkable um, because as he so, if, it's very effective. A podcast is a limited amount of time and the young people whom we really need to address are going more for podcasts than for books. Um, how do you spread the message? That is the difficult one. I think if people knew about it, but a lot of people don't even know about it. How do you get that message out? Hita, in spite of your books, I mean, you know, people just don't know that this exists and it's, it's sad. Well, I must thank you for including Mocha in here and also thank you so much for launching your book which we will always be telling people the book was launched right here at Mocha um, and also I do think there was a great felicity in having Kevin's uh, presentation and the way you described the uh, meticulous way you described it I think there is a resonance let's take some questions from the audience I'm going to go directly to Kevin for a response and a question please come up with one by the time I get there Kevin <laughs> Um, I mean, I'm, I'm very humbled to, to have heard you speak. Uh, my question would be, what are some of the objects that got left I behind? I can't quite hear. Can you uh, speak my, my up question, a little bit? Um, my question would be, what are some of the objects that got left behind that uh, you feel could have or should... What got left out? Um, I honestly don't think that I actually left out something that I absolutely had to have in there, but there was many choices that could be made within it. <coughs> For instance, um, Sikhism. Should I include Maharaja Ranjit Singh's chair, this absolutely gorgeous gold chair with all this uh, gold and red velvet, which is in the Victoria and Albert Museum? Or should I take something which is much simpler but resonates more, which is a silver parasol that hangs above the Granth Sahib, above the book? Or should I you know, take a picture, of a beautiful painting of the Golden Temple? So those were the sort of uh, really tricky choices that had to be made. And it was very difficult. It was so difficult to choose those 100 objects. Spent an awful lot of time playing with things. I wanted an image of the Buddha, but could I take a, a relic casket to represent the relics of the Buddha? Beautiful relic casket at the Victoria and Albert Museum again in crystal. And could that stand for it? Or should I take an image of the Buddha, the actual physical bodily image of the Buddha? There were and multiple questions of that sort that uh, I hope I haven't sort of left out something major in the book. Yeah, um, first, first of all, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Teheja and Vivek. It was really illuminating. I'm Lena Vincent, and I'm an art historian based here in Goa, and I've had the privilege of curating this exhibition, which is Engraved Treasures here. So uh, my question actually is about oral histories. I do work a lot with uh, oral histories 
and uh, you know, gathering things like family histories. I'm also working on a project for a museum of Cordova culture with IFA. So I, my question is that in your interpretations and the way you contextualize objects from different places, is there a degree of oral history study that also becomes part of uh, the entire story? And how do you deal with that when there are contradictions between something that is recorded history and oral history? That's an important question. There's a huge uh, amount of oral history. Um, how do you bring it in? I brought it in in one case when I was doing the Jewish marriage contract and talking about the Jews and using the Shingli songs which are sung by the Jews about these birds that are scattered and we are scattered around the world in the same way. It's, a, it's, a, it's an important question and it's quite a tricky question to handle. Um, yes, it would be nice to bring in more of it. Hi. Thank you, I'm, I'm Susanna Sardo. <clears throat> I'm an ethnomusicologist and thank you for your, for your book. I don't know the book, I, I wish I can have it. And I want just to connect with the, with the question made by by Vivek about uh, the cancellation movement and uh, uh, to share one experience and to ask you a question. The experience was recently I was in African Museum in... Uh, in I can't quite hear it. You can't hear me? Okay, I was in yes, African Museum in, uh, in Brussels where the, all this cancellation movement started uh, amongst the museums. Okay, they started the, the, in the Africa Museum all this decolonial way of, of presenting the museums. Actually, what they have done was to cancel a lot of, of objects, but they put them in a particular place of, of, of the museum. So the objects are exposed as cancelled objects, and they explain uh, very well why they, they are cancelled. So it's a very, very interesting um, process of, uh, of um, looking into a very critical way in this process of cancellation because I agree with you, we cannot erase story, we, the history, we, can, we, we need these objects in order to rethink the history and to, to, to learn things about, about the history. Uh, and the question I, I, I have to you is about um, uh, I, I think that some of these objects are not in India, right? Uh, yes. Yeah. What do you think about the process of repatriation? Okay, which is Th that question requires a double answer, I think. Um, in many cases, I chose to illustrate an object which happened to be in a collection abroad. Uh, the, the reasoning for that was very simple. Um, we rarely have, we don't have any sort of database in most museums. You can go to the National Museum and ask for an image. It, it's going to be very unlikely that you'll get a publishable image. They won't let you go in with your photographer or your, yourself with stands and lighting. They won't open the case so everything is reflected in the case while the museum collections overseas tend to have fabulous photographs readily available. And so one of the reasons so much of my, so many of my objects are from collections abroad is because of the photography restrictions here. Um, I don't believe that that implies that um, much of India's treasures are overseas. Almost every, all of India's treasures, a fraction of them are overseas. Everything is here, but it is made inaccessible. You can't even see it. I mean, I've been into the museum in, in Tanjavur, for example, and you had to first go out and buy colon spray and, and paper towels and clean the cases. And then you realize, my God, the dust is on the inside of the case. And how do you ever get, you know, it, the, the, that was the reason for so many of the objects being overse uh, from overseas collection. I don't know if that answers your question fully, but partially. Thank you. 
Uh, it's complicated. I would say like uh, uh, I have this Dolly Kikon. I don't know if you know she's a scholar from Nagaland who's in Australia. She is helping to quote unquote decolonialize, decolonize the Pit Rivers Museum. So certain cultures like Nagaland, actually most of the old objects are not in Nagaland. You know, th that's oh. one place where it's been unbelievably depleted and most of the things are actually in the UK. You know, but the question comes. So recently also we had this issue in uh, which relates to Goa when all these objects were found to be smuggled or bought illegally in Australia and a lot of them were given back. But there's a million dollar cross there and somehow the, it seems as though it's not really been claimed by the Indian government, you know. So it's a, it's a complicated question. Do we have, if suppose those objects come back from the Pitt Rivers Museum, if you've ever been to Nagaland, you know that you probably don't want it to go into the Nagaland, the museum, uh, you know, that's there in Nagaland. Um, so, you know, it's a complicated question. Do, what do, you, do you feel generally hopeful about the... Uh, status of objects in India? Do you feel like there are more institutions like MOCA and others doing a great job? I wish that there were more museums that would be at, at the level of MOCA. The current display and the fact that you can, you know, point your thing at the, at the, at the, at the sign and, and get information about it. I think every museum should do that. But you first have to start with cases which you can look into. I mean, the National Museum in New Delhi is such a disgrace. If you start with the National Museum, um, and then there are these objects that come back from overseas, and they've been sitting in crates in the, in the archaeological survey go down, and so much is made about Chola bronzes overseas. You know, they, they keep saying all the bronzes are there. Come on, you know, there were about 3,000 Natarajas made during the, the um, Chola period. There are at most, including the ones that have been repatriated, 30 overseas. They're all here. And then when things, they, they, they've taken all the Chola bronzes and put them <coughs> into these icon centers in order to not so that people don't uh, export them. They are available to nobody. They're not available to the worshiper for whom they were intended. They're not available to those who appreciate art. They're not available to anybody. So, I mean, I worry about those sort of things. They are in icon centers, which are concrete blocks, which have one door, which is sealed. There's no window, there's no air conditioning. There's nothing and they are susceptible to bronze disease. And it's very simple. When you ask somebody how to prevent bronze disease, they say, pour water on the image and give it fresh air. In other words, the festivities, the actual usage of those objects, take them in a procession around the temple and anoint them with whatever you want, including water. That's all that you need to prevent bronze disease. And locking them up, you know, you, you, there's a certain lack of responsibility and knowledge both, which worries me about solar bronzes at least, which seem to be the one that creates the most sensation when it's missing. Mm. Profound. Hi, first, thank you so much for giving us all this opportunity to listen to you. I'm Christina and I, I'm into research. So, you know, there's a lot of objects that you would see that would have a conflicting history or a dark history. And as you mentioned, you cannot be unbiased in what you're writing because you have your own opinion that you would stick to, as you mentioned in the beginning. And then we also spoke about how you cannot change the history of the object, whether you like it or you dislike it. So as the author, when you're writing it, because the people who are going to read it are going to respond and it's not necessary that they would agree or disagree. But what's the thought process that goes into certain objects like these would, would have conflicting histories that would hurt sentiments in an essence? I'm afraid you're going to have to repeat that for me. My ears are rather blocked today because I've got this head cold that I'm fighting off. Did okay. you hear it? Could you repeat it? Okay, so an object has a dark history or a conflicting history. And, you know, people will agree, they will disagree you have your own opinion that you will mention as you write. So, you know, what's the thought process that you have as the author for the people who will read it? 
Hmm? A, a dark or a conflicted history. Yeah, what do you do with it? So what would you, and you may have a different view of it, so how do you, that's I think the question as well. How do you deal with an object that has a conflicted history? I think it would be best to explain its con conflicted history and then put forward what research suggests as the most likely history. Do you have a, what about you, what do you think you would do in that case? Do you have an example in mind? Do you have an example in mind of an object that could be trouble if not handled uh, carefully? Like in the US obviously at the moment it would be an object that deals with the slave trade or maybe a slave trader. You know, I mean, uh, what about the equivalent here? Well, what about the renaming of roads? You know, Aurangzeb has become a con uh, has become a, a contested figure in Goa. Shivaji is a figure who is who is championed in a particular way. I do have Shivaji in this. I do have Aurangzeb in this. I do have all those figures. Um, I think in. <laughs> It is a tricky question you're asking me, but since I have both Shivaji and, and Aurangzeb here, let me try and answer that. Um, I do look at the latest research. I do give complete uh, credence to what is the local feeling about a particular thing. But in the case of Aurangzeb, I think it was also necessary to point out that Yes, for ex I give you just this one example. Yes, Aurangzeb did destroy some temples in Benares, but he destroyed them. So I've got to come back to that after telling you that he spent 15 years in the Deccan, and not a single Deccani temple was touched by Aurangzeb. So why did he destroy a temple in Varanasi? the records show us that it was being used as a meeting point to foment opposition to Muslim rule. And he keeps saying in his records, if you read the whole history, be good to the Brahmins because we need their support. So he, it's, it wasn't religious. It was, according to me, from the records that I've been able to put together, it was more that it was a political center of possible rebellion that he was quelling, rather than that he was quelling the Hindu faith. So, I mean, ultimately, it's a matter of, of the, just using the latest research and being bold enough to put your neck out there for somebody to chop off. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Questions? Uh, uh, hello, I'm Barun Sani. Um, uh, I, was, I was very taken by your idea of maybe a similar book on architecture. Uh, and sort of that just led to a thought that I was wondering if you could explore with us, which is, you know, in, in a way, objects can also be expressions of power. But there is, it seems to me, a difference between sort of, you know, uh, an object and a building, in that an ob object occupies space, whereas a building defines space in a way sort of, you know, encompasses space. So in that sense, buildings uh, become, it seems to be much more sort of expressive of power and power asymmetries and so on than objects do. And therefore, a similar book or, you know, of architecture would probably be uh, much more difficult to come up with, but also perhaps sort of, you know, much more contested. I don't know whether, whether you sort of would, would agree with this, this particular take. On Vivek's point about an alternate name for the museum, curiously, I've also thought about this, obviously not as profoundly as you have, and I always thought that perhaps calling it Moika, you know, uh, just, just throwing in an adjective there, because that actually in some ways does accurately represent what is being curated here, may in today's India make a world of a difference. But just a thought. Moiga is a uh, I'm, I'm, museum of Indian Goan art. I, a museum Indian. of old Goa, actually. It's the, you know, it should be just a museum. There is another museum, or the Santa Monica Museum. I mean, you know, these are all appropriate. Um, but they won't budge, I've tried. Um, it's Mocha. <laughs> Mocha. <laughs> That's settled. But, but my question on architecture. The, yes, on architecture. architecture. I believe. Um, uh, we 
there was the second edition which has just come out of the book and the publisher had a talk in Goa, I mean in, in Delhi uh, for it. And she said that they were contemplating a book. I didn't ask her who the author would be, but that they were contemplating a book of 100 famous buildings. It could be very interesting. It could well be done. It would also need to be, uh, I must say one other thing, the most difficult portions of this book was, although it's in thematic sections like, you know, intercultural encounters, the body, the urge to adorn, these sort of categories which allowed me to bring together a Nagaland necklace with a golden something, you know, urge to adorn. Um, it, it certainly, will be very much more challenging to do something on, on, on buildings. It'll need, the most difficult part of my book to me was as I came into the present, the 20th century. It, chronology can't be ignored. So basically these, these thematic sections also, I mean, they do range widely, but ultimately you do come into the present. And those were the sections that were the most difficult for me to pick the objects and decide how am I going to handle, can you leave Nehru out of the picture without, yes, you can, but you have to include him as well. And so I took Chandigarh as, and the, and the, the open hand, the hand to give, the hand to receive uh, as, as the emblem and use that to include partition and, and, and things of that sort. It's, it's very tricky. And the, the, I think the person who writes that will have to be an architect himself or herself um, in order to, to do justice to the last bit of the book, or maybe they have to have two authors uh, or something like that. But I think it's going to come. It'll be challenging. Uh, <clears throat> I'm Anita Dudane, and uh, my question is about the cancel culture. So, you know, when there's death or grieving, there's always first anger, you know. Similarly, there have been cultures, I mean, not just cultures, but feminism, for example, the Me Too movement, where women are concerned as well. There's so much anger that has to be aired somewhat, right? But afterwards, there will be acceptance. And then books like yours and people like you who can present a more equitable history that, yes, about Aurangzeb, this is what has happened and this is what has happened, will come through, at least hopefully, and we don't destroy the objects in the meantime before that happens. But there is a space, I guess, for people to react also, right? I mean, for example, slavery. I mean. If you were uh, a descendant of a slave, there will be anger. They have to be able to voice that, isn't it? No. You have certainly have a point. Absolutely. Hi, I'm Asavri Gurav. I'm a visual artist. Um, thank you so much for this book, first of all. When I was a visual art student at Baroda, um, there was an accessibility to the museum uh, of Baroda, but um, to get such easy access, a story, you know, you showed this uh, wonderfully page and, you know, Shah Jahan, because Shah Jahan's throne, and um, basically when you're studying art history, like when in Western art you have Jensen and Gardner, and you have that, those images and you have this short story. So when you're studying for exam, you would directly go to the images and the, you know, the gist of it. It's a shortcut, if you go to say. And in Indian art, you had like Susan Huntington, you have these reference books. You have to dig through them and you have to investigate. And you have to build a story for yourself. You have to understand the context. And many times it's, as an artist, it is bland for you. And I'm sorry to say, but it is data and information and you have to skim through all of that and try to make sense. 
like she said, she was talking about opinions. How do you, f uh, yeah, it's not much of a question, I'm sorry. Uh, it's more of, I'm just sharing that, sure. you know, this book is a gem for the uh, visual artists who are studying. And uh, yeah, and as you said, the architecture book, that would be amazing, but 100 <laughs> spaces would be a huge fat book to compile. I mean, that would be amazing too for the younger generation. So thank you. And also another thing, I, you, you started your lecture, like you started by talking about uh, objects around you, you know, uh, things which are usually just like there, but you are ignored. So um, Museum of Innocence, Orphan Pamuk's book, it came to me, uh, I, it, I just triggered that a fictional book was written down about all these objects, a fictional story, and then there is a museum which is actually built. So there are so many possibilities with objects, and these are like, what do you think, okay, now a question. What, <laughs> what do you think about, you know, like the, the metaphors which um, are ingrained in all these objects. So how do you weave those metaphors to create a storyline and to give a glimpse? It's like a curated, um, you know, it's a curation of a museum in India. It is a whole curation which you don't have to go. We usually, to look at the Kalpa Sutra, we would go to the VNA, you know, uh, Victoria Albert Museum and, you know, read that. But here you have a book and you can go through it and get a basic storyline. So, what role does metaphors play for you? This is a very literature question. <laughs> it's a comment. I'm going to leave that. It's, a, it's, it's an interesting comment. Is it a question? Is it a question? All right. <laughs> I just went to Amritsar a few, a few months back and I saw two depictions of history. One is the Partition Museum, which talks about the history of partition. And they present it from the point of view of the commoners, of people who went through the partition with a whole lot of audiovisual and things like that. And then in the Amritsar Golden Temple, there is a history captured largely through paintings. <coughs> I personally, related very strongly to the Partition Museum, probably because uh, they brought in stakeholders' views, very different stakeholders' views, and uh, they used audiovisuals and a whole lot of others. It was a very powerful experience. I just thought history is so complex. Uh, there may be very many different ways with technology to present history now. What a rich presentation in this wonderful space. Um, we have all been really, it's been a terrific privilege to listen to Professor Deja. Thank you so much for doing this. It's been marvelous. Thank you, Natasha, for this evening. A big hand, please, for Professor Deja. Now I can get rid of my... I can speak freely. Thank you so much, Dr. Deheja, for your presentation. Thank you, Vivek, for this wonderful conversation and uh, the very insightful comments that were made about the book, about the space, about various possibilities. Thank you to our wonderful audience, participants, friends of MOCA, all of you who came in today um, just to be part of these excellent uh, programs that we had put together. Thank you, Kevin, for your excellent presentation on the making of the podcast. I'm sure everyone's definitely going to listen to the first one because it's already up on Spotify. Thank you, Team IFA. We are so grateful for this collaboration and I hope we'll, we'll work together in the future as well. Uh, Menka, Ritika, Talika, thank you for being here with us uh, over the last two days. Thank you to my team at MOCA, to Heta, who's here as part of the managing committee. And uh, we've stepped into our 30th year with many dreams, 
and I hope many will be become and in, turn into reality. Um, and I think every good project takes time. The upgradation took time, but it's finally a wonderful museum from, thank you for all your words of praise. And those of us who have not yet seen the museum, you can still see it, it's open. And also to see the wonderful um, special exhibition that is on at the moment, Engraved Treasures, which Lena has curated in this beautiful space of the Church of Santa Monica. Thank you, have a good evening, and hope to see you soon at MoCA. The book, um, India, a story through 100 objects, we still have a few copies on sale, so if any of you would like to pick it, uh, do that, and Dr. Deheja is right here to get, you can get a signed copy. Thank you.